Uh, Jen, welcome back to the podcast. It's so good to have you on with us again. So, Thank you so much for having me for the second time. It's yeah. nice to be back. Oh, it's so good. So for those listening, Jen is the Director of Sleep Thrive Grow, a sleep consultant. Uh, and you've had your business now for what, about two and a half years. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. It's, um, yeah, it's, it's suddenly become a full-time gig now and, yeah. love, you know, really loving it. It's just, you know, definitely a passion of mine working and supporting families. So, mm. yeah, I'm just riding this wave now and can actually say, oh, my gosh, I'm a business owner, which is yeah. so crazy. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's just really nice to be able to offer the support out there. Oh, it's so amazing. And I think I was saying to you earlier that I've just loved to wa- loved watching your growth. So we obviously had you on, and I looked it up, we had you on at episode 33. Um, so for those listening, if you want to hear more about Jen's personal story, please go to that episode. But it's just been so fantastic to sort of watch you, you know, even in that conversation, you were like, oh, you know, I'm like, start, you know, you started obviously, but it's still yeah. the earlier stages of business. And now it's like amaz- amazing to see the growth. Um, so it's been really, really cool to watch your journey. Yeah. Um, and you were the first person that came to mind when we got some call, in, well, some confessions essentially um, for this vault segment around sleep. And I was like, I need Jen on. We need to get her expertise. So <laughs> thank awesome. you for agreeing to come on. <laughs> oh, pleasure. Pleasure. No, more than happy to. <laughs> so what we might do is we'll cut to the first confession regarding mm-hmm. uh, the toddler sleep. So, You asked us what keeps us up at night. My almost two and a half year old is keeping me up literally and figuratively. Since transitioning to a big boy bed back in December 2021, he wakes up multiple times during the night screaming and crying and also wakes up to start his mornings as early as 4am. Melatonin has helped to get him to sleep at night but doesn't stop the multiple wake-ups and early starts. We've been on antihistamine for about a week now and it was helping him sleep through and wake at a decent hour. However, the last few nights it hasn't worked, so now we're back to the drawing board. One can only hope that our paediatrician has a solution. This said almost two and a half year old also refuses to sit in his car seat and has figured out how to loosen the car straps by using the lever which is a major concern as we're constantly having to stop the car to tighten the straps. The Houdini strap also doesn't work because he has figured out how to get his arms out. All the while, we also have a four-month-old who's the most chilled out baby. So there you have it. I stay awake at night trying to think of ways to get my toddler to stay asleep and not wake up when it's still dark outside. Okay, Jen. So interesting one. And I feel like I can so relate. I mean, I've got a two and three year old and the sleep component is really tricky. And I think it even became more tricky when we sort of migrated to the toddler bed and all of a sudden they are mobile and have all of this freedom. So (laughs) it's like who invented this? Can't we just keep them in cots for like ever? (laughs) I know. I know. Well, talking about that anyway, it's, Mm. you know, it's one of those things that often as parents, we go through and we're like, okay, yep, now it's time for a bed. But sometimes it's actually, you can keep the cot for longer than maybe some people are choosing to, Mm. especially if you are having sleep problems before, Mm. the bed's unlikely to fix those. So if you're experiencing night waking and then you go to a bed, it usually just gets worse because they are mobile. So it is definitely something to be mindful of with Mm. the cot to bed transition is that you can, you know, maybe it's not until three, three and a half that you're looking at transitioning, um, Mm. depending on where they are um, and how their sleep's going. And I suppose as well, I mean, we had instances where the little one wanted to climb out of the cot, so it starts becoming unsafe. Yeah, and absolutely. That's, Mm. you know, that's one of the biggest things um, Mm. is obviously when there's a safety issue around being in the cot and they're going to hurt themselves, sometimes we're even though they may not be sleeping that great or waking still quite frequently, we're almost forced to provide that next step because their safety becomes the priority. Yes. Um, So, yeah, there is a little hack that it doesn't work for every cot, but you can actually try and lower the base so Mm. that the mattress is almost on the floor level and the base is on the floor level and it creates Mm. a bit more height with the bars. Mm. But you have to be mindful of 
whether any gaps are going to be there where they could get their hands under. So mm -hmm. a few cots do it, not every cot, but it is it can kind of create a bit of a saviour and a, mm -hmm. give you another six months up your sleeve sometimes. That's interesting. Right. Mm. So it's sort of potentially investigating those cot options too. Um, yeah. What do we – so I know for me, we've, I've, my three-year-old is in the toddler bed um, and it's kind of becomes almost like a habit where he, you know, good night, I say good night, close the door, you know, within yep. 30 seconds he's out. Oh, mum, oh, you didn't give me a kiss. All right, go back in. All right, now yeah. then he's out. Oh, oh, my finger hurts. Okay, yeah, yeah. And it's like <laughs> yeah. constantly and it's just so frustrating because you're, you're at the end of your day. All yes. you want to do is just chill out on the couch and like be like by yourself or spend mm -hmm. a bit of time with your partner or whatever that looks like and you're going in and out so many times. You know, why do kids do this and how can we sort of help um, that transition and make it a little bit easier on them and us? Absolutely. So I think it's really important to understand that our children are not mini adults. Um, they're also just developmentally in a whole different place. You know, they're all about learning cause and effect, learning how their parents will respond to if they do this, what what can happen in that instance, you know, testing the boundaries is, mm. it's literally, it's not a toddler being annoying, it's actually part of their development. And mm. when we start to see that, okay, a lot of this is down to them not being annoying, is mm. actually that they just can't resist that. And, you know, really as well, we don't see impulse control with toddlers developing until two and a half, three years of age, they may be able to resist some urges that they have at that point. Mm. Um, but it really depends on where your toddler is in their development too, you know, mm. so you can say, okay, around three years, they should have some impulse control, but still there's a lot of toddlers that don't and they really struggle. You know, there's that, um, there's that little experiment, you know, how you put like a chocolate cake in front of a kid and walk away and say, yep. don't eat that. And, mm. you know, if you watch that experiment, there's lots of of toddlers that can mm. resist that urge, that impulse to take that cake. Mm -hmm. And there's some that just cannot, like they just have to eat it. Mm. So I think when we start to learn, you know, if you talk about your kids or imagine that scenario, do any of your kids, would you say, oh my gosh, he would just smash that cake when I was away he would mm. definitely try to test that or you know would you have this child that sits back and goes no mm. I've you know two of mine would definitely wait one of mine absolutely not she could not resist the urge mm. at all so mm. you know and she's five now so mm. I think um understanding the development is huge and it does make us hopefully just reduces some that some of that frustration that this isn't going to be forever mm. um you know, there's also fears that can develop at that age. So some of it can be that fear of separation from a parent. That's, you know, their imagination really kicks in around two and a half, three years of age. So mm. before then, then, you know, there wouldn't be a fear of the dark. But now potentially that's something. And they're really mm. understanding that everyone, when they go to bed, things are happening on the outside. You aren't going to bed. Like there's, mm. you know, that FOMO is huge. Like there's mm. so many things development wise mm. um and then another big thing we often miss because we're busy parents is that connection factor you know they really need that one-on-one -on -one connection from us and some days we always struggle you know no one's perfect and mm. we've gone about our day we've got home and we're just going through what we need to do dinner bath you know get it all done and mm. oh my gosh can't wait to sit down mm. um, but sometimes we forget our little people that actually are seeking that one-on-one -on -one. and actually it's amazing what 10 minutes one-on-one -on -one, solely engaging mm. eye contact loving connection before bed mm. can sometimes reduce some of those constant up and down because they mm. felt that connection right before bed so mm. um yeah it's it's a really when you take a step back and maybe consider the development or behavior behind why mm. um sometimes it can just make it a little bit easier and I think that's such a good point you raised there around that connection piece. Um, and mm. I even notice if I, doesn't matter how frustrated I am, if I, if little Noah's come out of the room and it's been the third time now, and yeah. at this point I'm like, I've been nice the last two times, <laughs> now I'm over it, and I'll yeah. be like, get in bed, and he'll hear my tone, yes. then I almost am guaranteed as I walk out that door that he's definitely going to come back out. And often he'll be yeah. like, mum, be happy with me, mum. And it's like, yeah. I, it's just because I couldn't contain my 
anger. So then I have to grit my teeth, walk back in and be like, I am happy, darling. Cuddle, (laughs) kiss. And then if I do that and leave him, I'm a lot more likely, it's a lot more likely that he will stay asleep. So is that sort of that connection piece as well as allowing time between the two of you, but also leaving them in a good sort of emotional sort of state, would you say? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I think it is, you know, it's, you need to have boundaries, right? So it's, you know, um, sometimes we can feel bad about certain boundaries that we uphold, but toddlers do need to have boundaries, but you can have so much flexibility within them. So Mm -hmm. your boundary might be that it's um, bedtime and you're to stay in your bed when it's bedtime, but Mm -hmm. within up until then, they can choose what pajamas they wear, they can choose which story they read. So they've Mm -hmm. got some control. But your one set boundary that you're not going to budge on is like, no, it's bed is bed, like Mm. it's, this is it. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, if we can provide those boundaries and maintain them with that sort of like, love and confidence, calmness, kindness, I think all of those four things, it generally will get a better result. Whereas if we're sort of you know, and again, we're only human, right? There's, I don't think there's a parent out there that hasn't lost their call or just gone, Mm. oh my gosh, like, Mm. you know, you're not, you don't have to be perfect. But Mm. if we can try to, you know, do better next time and be like, okay, actually, I saw that that didn't work. All Mm. right, I'm gonna, how can I prepare myself leading up to bedtime that, you know, almost managing your expectations that I can expect a few visits or Mm. a few pop outs. Yeah. How am I going to, you know, to maintain this this calmness and kindness that yes. I know my toddler needs in that moment? Yes. Um, so I think, yeah, preparing as a parent um, is going to really help you, you know, keep that consistent boundary mm. and also display it to your toddler the way you want it to come across as well. Yeah, that's so true. And I think I've been doing that instinctively now. I'm like, that's it. He yeah. will wake up several times. So this is what it is and keep the voice calm, blah, blah, blah. But yeah, yeah it's certainly not easy. I want to talk about when you're experiencing really tough times with them staying in bed. So for example, mm. we just came back a few weeks ago from Greece. The jet lag was a nightmare and he got oh, to the gosh, point yeah. where honestly, he was up every other minute of the night. It was a nightmare. Yeah. I went to the GP and I said, look, what do we do? Because I just, I'm becoming a crazy person. She mm. we, she gave me a script to go to a compound pharmacy and get melatonin. So, mm. I, and what I found with melatonin, and obviously you're only meant to use it, I think three to five nights is what the pharmacist has told me. We used it for three. It helped get him to sleep more easily. Mm. It doesn't keep them asleep though. That's what I realized. I'm like, what yeah. do I need to give them to keep them asleep? But yeah, like it certainly helps to, to put them asleep. And it did help with getting him back into his routine. I was yeah. curious your thoughts on, you know, melatonin and mm-hmm. anything else that could poten- potentially support a parent if they're really struggling. Yeah. So I think, um, you know, in your circumstance, you have you went away and jet lag was just playing havoc with his sleep cycles Mm. and you just needed something and to get him back on track. And that, you know, it makes a lot of sense. Mm. Right. And I think it's, you know, knowing that we have these potential tools as parents to help us in situations like that. um, I think a lot of the time it's diving in a little bit deeper. And like we mentioned before about Mm. the development and behavior, like, is Mm. there, something going on or you know has something changed in their routine can we put it down to anything is it that they have just transitioned into a bed and it's just new and this up and down is a phase we've got to ride out so I think Mm. rather than kind of just going cool let's just get melatonin to sort the problem out let's Mm. see if we can work and delve in on you know managing that behavior or Mm. giving them some tools and or getting tools ourselves as parents to manage and guide that. So mm. role play is really effective for toddlers. I love role play. You know, it's it also brings out the kid in you as well. But, you know, I love running through like a bedtime routine with a toddler because sometimes we're, again, expecting them to stay in their bed. But have we told them what our expectations are? Have we explained to them, communicated to them what we're looking for? Like, or are we just going oh, why are they getting out of bed? So 
talking to them about your expectations during the day. So it's not right before they're going to bed. It's like you've, you're starting to plant the seed throughout their day, mm. um, talking them through a bedtime routine. Um, so even using, as I said, role play like a teddy and making up a mock bed on the floor in their room and say, and practicing and doing that with them. So, you know, this can be done with two year olds as well, not, you know, not just those older toddlers. Mm. Um, but you can like tuck Teddy in and say, okay, let's let's um turn the light off. Let's see if Teddy stays in his bed all night. Mm. You know, go out of the room and then go, okay, let's it's morning time. Let's check on Teddy. And we can start to look back and go, wow, Teddy stayed in his bed all night. What a clever Teddy. Do you mm. think you could do that? I think you could, you know. So it's like not it's building up some really nice momentum. Mm. And sometimes you can leave that Teddy there and almost mm. plant the seed to be like, you know, in the night, if you wake up, if you see Teddy still in his bed, it must be still nighttime. And, you know, again, it's just sometimes it's so nice to get, you know, with a lot of us, we find it difficult to connect to child play. Um, But it's something that is going to benefit them. Like we're, we're kind of creating that scene and we may find it a bit easier to connect with them that way. So yeah. it's, you know, it's really good. And, you know, in the morning you can give them a cuddle, give Teddy a cuddle, like, oh, gosh, look at you two. And it's, you know, they're not mm. seeing Teddy as a Teddy. They're seeing Teddy as like another little friend in their yes, room. So, yes. so when we start to lay down those foundations, mm. I think some of that can really help. Also mm. our expectations that if they do get up in the night, what's going to happen? What are you going to do? So, um, you know, if we're having too many big conversations with our toddlers in the middle of the night, mm. that's a great incentive to get up, you know, whether it's good, bad or ugly, mm. they, they're not worried about that. They're just like, I get to see my parents, you know, this is, this is all good. Mm. So I think it's explaining to them um, before. So, you know, if you do wake up in the night, mummy will be taking you straight back to bed. I'm not mm. going to be talking to you because it's sleep time and we all need our rest. Mm. Um, so it's really, really kind of set those those boundaries of what you're going to do and how it's going to roll when mm. they do wake up yeah um and then another big thing when they do if they have woken up in the night not kind of focusing on the negative and being like oh you woke up four times last night I'm so over it or mm. you know mm. going along that track yeah it's it's really trying to maybe word it in a way that oh, you only woke up twice last night. I think you're so close to being able to do this. Let's mm. see what happens tonight. Mm. Um, you know, and then leaving it, just dropping the subject, yep. reminding them again during the day, your expectations, mm. you know, and then once they've had a bit of familiarity, you can say it just before bed. So what were you, what, what are we going to do overnight? What's our expectations? And they can, they might be able to repeat those back to you and say, stay in my bed and like yeah that's really good let's mm. see how we go mm. um yeah and it's just sometimes these little planting seeds and these little remembering to to actually feed the positive mm. um and not focus on the negative I think it's really difficult sometimes as parents it's yes. we naturally when we're overwhelmed go to that critical phase of you know state and we all do it mm. um you know, I'll catch myself sometimes and think, oh, my God, I said that so I just was focusing on what they didn't do. Yes. And, you know, and it's and you sort of kick yourself after um, for mm. it. But it's mm. again, I think if you can start by even getting those tools to begin to want to change or how you you use your language that's you're already setting yourself up in a better way yeah I love that and it, it reinforcing sort of the the good behavior I we actually ended up doing a little sticker board and it was like yeah. you know if you get two if you only yeah. wake up twice you get a smaller sticker but if you wake up once a little bit bigger and if you don't wake up at all then you get x and so just kind mm -hmm. of reinforcing that good behavior and um I the other thing that came to mind as you were talking was we have like Sam the sheep with like this yeah, little the light the yeah sheep. so it's yeah. kind of red when it's for those who don't know it, a little sheep with a little clock on it and it turns red when it's nighttime and then yellow mm. when it's almost time to wake up and then green when it's time to wake up and that, we took that overseas with us too because they know yeah. Sam the sheep does not lie so they, have yes. to, they have to go with Sam the sheep so you know there are little tools like that and I was curious as to whether you sort of endorse those those little or night lights and things like that too what are your thoughts yeah I do I do love grow clocks I think mm. they can work really well um 
the time and Sam the sheep is a good one because mm. for those younger toddlers um, that aren't necessarily, you know, we have other grow clocks that kind of count back the stars and things like that. Okay. Whereas Sam the sheep's got the eyes shut and the yeah. eyes open. Yes. Like it's a really easy visual um, connection to yes. when it's sleep time. Yes. Um, so, yeah, but also I find the parents that have said to me, oh, grow clocks don't work or this doesn't mm-hmm. work. Generally, what we've done is maybe set the expectations too high. So we've, mm-hmm. you know, say if our, our kids are getting up at 5 a.m. in the morning, we've gone, okay, 6 a.m. would be great. Let's set the clock to 6 a.m. And that's just initially going to be so unachievable for Mm. your toddler to reach. Mm -hmm. You know, that's an hour where they're normally getting up at five to Mm. have to follow this rule. And likely you're going to fail. They're going to lose Mm. interest and it's just not going to work. So Mm. you're better off as much as it will kill you um, to actually set the clock for 5 a.m. Mm. and then get a few days where they're like, oh, my gosh, I've done it. Like, And Mm. getting that positive reinforcement. Okay. Then you can add, you know, three days later, add another 10, 15 minutes onto Mm. that Mm. and keep working towards that goal. You're more likely to get success with a grow clock that way Mm. than, than again, just hoping for the best and going, okay, I'm setting it to six. Yeah. And I I did that. I did that Mm. with my son like mm. I before I learned um or did any extra studies with sleep mm. I did the same thing and thought yep it's not gonna work um mm. it didn't work mm. purely because I not learned how to implement it effectively that's such a good tip I love that mm. um changing tact a little on the final comment made in this course <laughs> confession mm-hmm. um I've never heard of this before and I feel for this caller their little child undoing their cast their own seat belt in the car have you ever come across this with all of the clients that you're working with (laughs) oh that must be so scary like really really tricky Mm. I I know there's certain gadgets you can buy that may help with that Mm. I haven't actually experienced it myself as a parent or Mm. heard a client that has Mm. um but you know I'm I'm not surprised it doesn't surprise (laughs) me um it could happen you know those little fingers can be yeah so um and it's again once they've done it it's really hard like in to wear off that habit it's just yes. like this is great you know the reaction I get but of <laughs> course um is amazing like mm-hmm. I get the mum to stop the car like this everything happens <laughs> like this is fantastic um so you can see why there's just no there would be zero impulse control on how to like, be like I'm okay with this now I'm gonna press this button constantly um so yeah uh... I think it's yeah, in that sense, really trying to look into some kind of yeah supported device, which yes. as I said, I'm sure the internet is filled with little tricks and yeah. um it's got it's not gonna be just that one parent that's that's no. gone through the door. That's but, so um, true. We went we went through the experience of our little ones loving to open the door and that was totally that the car door um but that was totally fine because you could lock it and that's all good but we were in yes. the cab on the way to the airport like a month ago <laughs> we were in the taxi I hadn't even thought I had the little one on my lap and he we're on the, on the freeway and he oh. goes to reach for the car door I, it oh, no. becomes a jar and I went oh <laughs> my god so I've like shut it quickly and the cab driver's like what just happened I'm like ah oh, never mind I'm like holding it my toddler's hands oh, together no. like don't touch the door yeah. but it's just amazing what they do and what they're used to trying right so oh, yeah I feel for this person but as you said yeah. uh, internet will be your best friend um I'd yeah. like to go to recording number two where we're talking yeah. more about intolerances and the impact mm-hmm. on sleep yeah okay cause, so we've played that recording so something that had been keeping me up at night until recently was my four-month-old Bob being super unsettled all the time As first-time parents, we obviously had nothing to compare it to, and when people, doctors, maternal health nurses all say that it's normal for babies to cry all the time, especially in the evenings, we figured that must be the case. We were told the crying would slowly start to reduce, which it never did, until finally it was diagnosed that our baby has an intolerance to dairy and soy. It took cutting those things out of my diet for four weeks to confirm. Prior to this, we had pretty much thought we had the most unhappy baby in the world. He would scream for hours on end and always had to be carried. Now we know that it was because he was so uncomfortable all the time. One of the key things we've learned from that is if you have a feeling that something isn't right, you just need to persevere until you get an answer or find a solution. We were told his crying was perfectly normal multiple times, even when it seemed quite extreme to us. 
we seriously thought we were going crazy, but once diagnosed, we were able to move forward and now we have a much happier baby. Interesting one. And the reason why I thought I'd have a quick chat to you about it, Jen, is I was just curious as to whether you're noticing people coming to you for sleep guidance and ultimately you're realizing that it's actually a dietary issue that is impacting their sleep too. Talk to me about your experience with this. Yeah, so definitely I work with a lot of babies that may have like sensitivities and intolerances. Mm. 100% if if things aren't adding up or there's, you know, they seem to say they're really unsettled or they're vomiting a lot or, you know, just really uncomfortable. I'm always 100% first to say, just to see what path they've already gone down. Like, have you spoken to a GP about this if you're concerned? Have Mm. you you know, delved in a little deeper. Um, So often if they haven't, I will say, look, it may be worth talking to your GP first, just making sure there's nothing underlying. Mm. Um, And then we can certainly work together. I mean, things like reflux as well. So there will obviously be a mixture of babies that are on medications for reflux or Mm. depending on the severity Um, it will be managed in other ways and forms like certain things like holding upright after feeding and you know they you know having some information around that Um, I do find and a big thing is over tiredness um, does kind of exacerbate all those symptoms as well Mm -hmm. so um, you know naturally when we're overtired our bodies we're releasing a lot more cortisol and Mm -hmm. this can kind of like almost tense up just like we are as adults when we're stressed Mm. um you know we our digestion doesn't always work so efficiently and Mm -hmm. things like that the Mm -hmm. same with kids when they're overtired it creates a stress response on their body Mm. so often I'll find um you know it's definitely not we can't resolve sleep problems when they're going through certain things because often when we start to look at the overtiredness and combat that Mm -hmm. some of these symptoms really reduce naturally um, based on that they're just more relaxed they're not tired and stressed so Mm -hmm. um, but yeah it's I think it's um, things to look out for if you're you're thinking that your children are suffering from some intolerances or you know, some kind of sensitivities Mm. is things like excessive wind, um, you know, that unexplained unsettledness where mum's just feeling something isn't quite right. That's, you know, it's definitely that gut feeling. Mm. Um, Bowel changes, obviously, if you're just noticing differences or things you're not sure about Mm. in regards to the bowel motions. And Mm. sometimes we just don't know what it's supposed to look like. So Mm. definitely um, learning about that, vomiting, or discomfort after feeding. Mm -hmm. Um, Often if there is some kind of intolerances and sensitivities, ultimately the body is, is there's an inflammatory response there. So what can, what we can get out of that is we might see eczema or Mm -hmm. ear, nose and throat problems or hives or rashes. So, you know, the intolerances in the gut is actually coming out in other forms. Um, Mm. So it's always, you know, definitely worth checking if you're sort of noticing things in regards to your baby's skin or something like that. Mm, That's interesting. They're all such great points. And I think what I'm hearing is, and even from this caller, there was a, she had a gut instinct that something wasn't right. Then yeah. that was impacting the sleep, uh, you know, and it, it's kind of like, well, is it just, is, is it just a, a baby that just doesn't know how yeah. to settle yet? And that's the hardest part, I think, when they're babies too. It's not like you've got a basis to work from. You're no. kind of just like, they were born this way. Is this normal? And particularly, let's say it's their first child, even more yes. difficult. So I guess, you know, if someone's listening going look yeah I feel like deep down something's not quite right but maybe my baby's just a bad sleeper it, mm-hmm. and and that it's because they haven't slept in so long that maybe that's all it is I guess what I'm hearing from you is look explore all options and just Definitely. you know tick off tick it off with the GP make sure there's nothing underlying that you might be missing as well it may not be as simple as oh they just don't know how to sleep right is, is that yeah. essentially your guidance around that hundred percent. And I think, you know, ultimately, I mean, it's like the sleep education we get as new parents is very minimal. Mm. I mean, a lot, it's a lot on feeding focus, which really, you know, I'm, I'm happy it goes feeding then sleep if that's the way it's going to go, because Mm. we do definitely want to make sure that they're getting all that nutritional needs, that the feeding is going well so they can gain weight and start to thrive. So I think if you're, you know, if you're noticing any feeding issues or 
um, generally that's where you're likely going to see some of the main intolerances is mm. in regards to how they're feeding um, yeah. or, or post-feeding or, or symptoms in regards to that. Mm. Get that all checked out. You know, there's so many, like I look, look back and there's so many things I would have done differently with my second with, mm. you know, I really think she did have a lip tie, for example, and I got told at, from the hospital that she was fine mm. and being a second time mama I actually was in the under the impression like I should know all this and this is fine mm. um, but I really wished I'd listened to my gut more and gone do you know what this is really I've breastfed so well with my son this is mm. if, you know this isn't going well yeah um, I really wished I'd kind of like just listened to my inner self and gone just ask for help just mm. then no one's going to you know it's finding the right people right and I yeah. and I know from this caller like she felt like she was fobbed off or mm. you know um and it is it does put that challenge for us as parents because we are in a very very out of our depths mm. and not sure what's right or wrong and mm. but I do I do definitely encourage parents and I think it's getting better that we're like no you you like you have the right to talk to two or three people if you need to yes find that right one and yeah look down those avenues talk to friends who have they worked who have they gone to mm -hmm. you know really just t kind of do your research on who you meet so fingers crossed you get a better experience yes. and some and get heard from someone um and have avoid all these practitioners that maybe aren't sort of listening to you or just kind of putting you in a first mum category and then yes. going oh she's overreacting yes. you know yes yeah 100 so it's so hard honestly and as I said if, if it's your first it's just yeah it's really tough um all right so I'd like to cut to the third caller and so we'll play that one now some of the struggles we faced with our newborn child was just having a very unsettled baby and having them been put to sleep, sometimes you're up there rocking them and shushing them for close to an hour only to put them down and then to wake right up again, which was extremely frustrating. This process went on for a good three months, which was quite testing on my mental health. But safe to say that he's in a very good sleep routine now and things are better than ever. That was a, a really interesting confession from a dad, nice and brief, but I think a, a really good message there that I'd like to delve into with you around our mental health as parents and, you know, particularly the sleep. Like that, yeah. for me, that dictated everything when it came to how my mental health then was. You're not sleeping and I was literally like dragon mum, right? So it's yeah. um, I'd love to hear from you because, I mean, you see people day in, day out, my baby, it's not sleeping, I, therefore I'm not sleeping and I'm just yeah. a mess and everyone's a mess. What guidance, other than the techniques and the tools that you would provide to the parents to support their children, what things would you suggest we do as parents to support ourselves? Yeah, I think it does come down to our own sleep sleep hygiene as well because, mm. um, you know, we sometimes try and stick to old habits like pre-kids, which we could be staying up till midnight or having a glass of wine every night mm. and then we <laughs> chuck in a baby that's not sleeping and we're sort of set in these old habits mm. that we're doing and you're, it's just going to send you down an even darker path. Mm. Um, so it's it's so hard though, isn't it? Like you try and find that balance between okay, it's my time now. And, um, you know, now the child's in bed for however long, I just mm. want to make the most of it. Um, but yeah, it comes down to really the simple things of, you know, trying to look after you, um, finding some time to, you know, get out, have some fresh air, um, mm. you know, maybe it's some relaxation type of exercises. I always suggest to my parents that I work with, you know, if your baby's crying or unsettled, just take a minute and take like three deep breaths. Because if you go in there with that energy, that mm. anxiety, that stress, yep. your baby will feel that tenfold and you're likely going to end up just having a longer, harder settle mm. rather than if you try and center yourself before, mm. um, sometimes the outcome is a lot calmer and it's mm. your baby starts to co-regulate that from you. So, mm. Um, yeah, and I think where you can get support, if you've got the support, I know there's lots of families I work with have like FIFO, 
husbands and it's really difficult but if you've got like a you know a friend even or a, or a pair or a grandparent that can come in and you know take some of the load off or you know gosh hi, like if you can get someone to do some of the ch- basic chores in your house if you have that as an option yeah. anything you can do um is going to definitely help you tr- you know, in that process of managing your mental health amongst sleep deprivation. Mm, It's so hard. And even just listening to you talk, I'm like, it's so ridiculous what we have to go through. Like you're sitting there going, I need to look after myself so I can look after you. But if you're not letting me look after myself, then how am I meant to look after you? But I have to look after you, but I'm not looking after myself. And it's just like such a mind game, isn't it? Like it's a minefield. And no wonder, I mean, I had both pre and postnatal depression. I wonder why right like it's enough to just tip you over the edge and particularly Mm -hmm. you know I'm type a get shit done kind of human being so you got the baby too and you're like okay I can handle this I can do this I mean I'll follow the book and I'll follow the you know and it will be fine and then when you're not achieving the goal because you're dealing with an independent human and then you're not sleeping and then you're starting to doubt your gut instinct and all (laughs) of the things we just spoke about it is just such a minefield like yeah. Isn't it crazy? <laughs> it, it, it's it's ridiculous. And I remember like having to adjust to, you know, like for example, like I would clean the house, you know, one top to bottom one day a week. Yeah. And then yeah. I had a baby and I tried to like maintain that. And I was constantly getting angry and frustrated because I'd be like, oh my gosh, I can't even do this. And then yes. this, you know. And then I had to just really, I think it's changing our it, it, it teaches you a lot of lessons, right? Or yeah. just a lot of life skills to manage expectations, to being able to fleet between things and go, okay, that's all right. Like I'm halfway through this, but I'm going to have to leave it. And, yes. you know, rather than because else it just does feed onto your parenting and then you become this angry person and um, that's not what who you want to really be. Um, yes. and so it is very much... Um, realizing that yeah uh, you know you are much more needed for everything than you were before how can we manage this realistically without losing our minds so I think I think um knowing you know and that's what I love working with families with Mm. sleep because you know I see families that have have put up with it for so long like Mm. and they're that sleep deprived Mm. and you know, that's what really breaks my heart because I think, you know, I know how that feels. I know yeah. those feelings of sleep deprivation. And, yes, we're, we're going to always have wakeful moments as parents, mm. but they, they get to, there's a point, right? And it's yeah. like waking two hourly for six months straight. Ugh. Nah, like you, nah. there's something we can do about that. And there's yeah. definitely tools and support out there that can mm. help navigate. So, yeah, I think... It just has such uh we always almost forget how important sleep is for oh, our health and yes. it 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 sort of supports our concentration, mm. like how we function, like our self-worth. It's just it's just such a crucial basic human need yes. that we sometimes always push to a side. Yes. And yeah, it's as it's important as as eating, you know, it's yeah. really or drinking it's just really along that lines and it's yeah. right up there that needs to be in the forefront and it does mm. it just has a snowball effect on everything else um yes. so, oh, yeah 100 and honestly thank goodness for you know businesses like yourselves who are out there trying to support us parents because you know we need you i think i don't think there's yeah. one family i know that's like oh yeah sleep happy days i mean actually yeah. no I'll correct myself. I've got some friends at the moment who have little, like, couple of month old children, and they're like, "Oh yeah, yeah. sleep, it's sweet." And I'm like, "Oh, that's good. Enjoy it while it lasts." Because <laughs> yeah. I'm like, "Talk to me when they're four, and then tell me that they were a unicorn sleeper for four years, and then yeah. we can have a champagne over that, not yeah. after four months of having a perfect sleep." <laughs> you know. Yeah. So oh. everyone has difficulties eventually, yeah. right? I mean, not to scare those who are who believe no. they have unicorn sleepers, but you know, and some will experience more hardships than others but ultimately this is where I think you know businesses like yourselves are just so so critical for for our children and more importantly for us as parents in in a really tough time of which what can be a tough time of our lives when we are not sleeping um just on that I would love you to tell um those listening a little bit more about how they can find out uh more about you yeah so um my website is 
sleepthrivegrow.com. Mm-hmm. Um, you can check me out on in Instagram as well, which is sleep underscore thrive underscore grow. And there's lots of useful free info, crazy reels, but stuff that's really going to help guide you in your parenting or maybe there's an issue that you really relate to. Um, Facebook as well. But yeah, and um, I've got a lot of range of packages because I know for a lot of people, sometimes it's just all they need is a phone call. And other times it's actually working together for like a two week support package. So Mm. Sometimes, you know, I just have these clients that just check in every few months and they're like, okay, I'm going through this, you know, rather than just sitting there getting stressed out about it, they just act on it and go, cool, awesome, great, thanks, Jen, I've got this info now. So I think it's really useful to have a range of support that people need because we're all very different we're not all made the same our babies Mm. are all different so yeah I do like to cater and have that range of support that people can access yeah I love that and I'll pop those details in the episode notes as well thank you so much again Jen for your time pleasure lovely to chat Leonie